Hey everyone, Laszlo Montgomery again, Tea History Podcast, episode 10 this time. More Ming Dynasty stuff for you. Last time we got a nice intro to the great porcelain capital of China, the city of Jingdezhen, just a little south of the Yangtze River and west of Lake Poyang in historic Jiangxi province. Without any further chit-chatting or yammering, let's keep going with the Ming Dynasty. Tea leaves had gone from being boiled during the time of the Tang to being crushed and ground to powder in the Song, and finally in the Ming, steeping leaves in boiled water. Zhu cha, to mo cha, to pao cha. Beginning in the 14th century, the Ming rulers took a long time to finally fight off those Mongols and subdue them. This wasn't done until the time of Yong Le. Horses? were no less important than ever before, and something as important as the tea horse trading system remained critical to the dynasty's well-being. In the Ming, the horse trading offices in Shanxi and Shanxi managed the trade. The Ming government controlled all export of tea. Same thing when Mao took over in 1949. The market prices determined by the Ming government were 120 jin of tea for a superior horse, 70 jin for an average one, and 50 jin of tea for an inferior horse. These were the prices set by them, and to enforce this, they really cracked down on anyone trying to export tea outside the system. A jin is 1.1 pounds, or 0.6 kilos. Jin is sometimes called a Chinese pound. It's also referred to as one caddy. The tea tax, in place since 973, the final years of the Song Emperor Taizu, by the end of the Ming and into the Qing, was gradually reduced. By this time, it was acknowledged that tea had become such an important daily use item, taxing it was causing undue hardship on the peasants and commoners. Once loose tea became the accepted norm, and I don't know who would want to keep using bricks or tea cake, well, it led to an explosion of new tea varieties. Many of the famous teas we drink today came out of the Ming Dynasty. Do you remember from a previous episode, a famous tea is what these former tribute teas are called today. We'll go over them later on in the series. Brick tea was still manufactured in the Ming. The Chinese may have turned their back on it, but the Russians and other Central Asian people continued to demand this form. The whole custom of Xi Cha started in the Ming during the loose leaf era. This involved washing the tea. Xi means to wash. This involved pouring boiled water over the leaves first. Then you dumped out this water and the leaves were now considered cleaned, or cleaner than they were before. You always want to do this when using loose leaf tea. Now I couldn't find the source again after I read this somewhere, but... There was an old saying, always offer the first pouring of tea to your enemy. In other words, when you make that first pour, that tea isn't clean, and there might be who knows what in there. The belief was if you poured hot water and then dumped it, well, whatever there was in terms of dust, impurities, microbes, or whatever, undesirable things, yeah, you dealt with it. So that's why you got that saying, don't dump the tea. Serve it to someone you don't like. Let's talk about Yi Xing teapots for a bit. We discussed Yi Xing in an earlier episode. That's the area near Mount Guzhu where the famous purple bamboo tea, or Zi Sun Cha, came from. Lu Yu wrote a good portion of the Cha Jing, the classic of tea, over there. Yi Xing's former name was Yang Xian. You remember Yang Xian tea that inspired Lu Tong to write the poem Seven Cups of Tea. This place is going to become even more famous because of these teapots that came out of there. What Jing De Zhan was to porcelain ware, Yi Xing was to those small purple clay teapots. There was a third center in China for tea ware. This was De Hua in central Fujian, west of Quanzhou. Like Jing De Zhan, they had no shortage of kaolin material around De Hua, and they too developed quite a porcelain legacy. In and around Yi Xing, they have this clay called Zi Sha. 
zi means purple, and sha means sand, or anything granular. I think I mentioned the area around Yixing had been making these purple clay pots as far back as the Song, but it's in the Ming where these things came into their own and became wildly popular. The clay comes in three basic colors, depending on how much oxidized iron is concentrated in the mixture. They can either be a coffee or cream color, red or purple brown. The clay coming out of Yixing, all lead free, comes in five colors. Red, black, purple, green, and yellow green. But you could combine these different colors and add all kinds of pigments to get it to a nice wide range of earthen hues. It's a very laborious process to get the raw material from the ground into a moldable clay. What you have in the end, and perhaps the best selling point about Zisha ware, is that because there's no glaze, the clay is porous, and thus, over time, it absorbs the oils and flavors of the tea that are poured inside. That's why you don't really want to mix teas in a single zisha teapot. The zisha teapot you use for your best pu'er, well, you don't want to use it with your freshest tie guan yin. That's one of the special things about zisha. All that flavor absorbed over the years actually seasons the teapot, and this in turn enhances the taste of the tea later on. In fact, there's an old saying or story that if you used one single zisha pot to brew one single type of tea for long enough, after a while, you didn't even need to add tea leaves. The pot itself would give off the flavor or essence of the tea. So with these things, you never, never wash them with soap. You have to raise these teapots, like a Neopet. Remember them? In Chinese, this is called yang hu, to raise the teapot. You got to take care of it and allow it to realize its greatest potential one day. Collectors love yixing teaware. Since you're only supposed to limit the use of one yixing teapot to one selection of tea, it's common for true tea experts to have multiple teapots for multiple teas. Collectors will have both decorative, and practical yixing teapots. The decorative ones, of course, eh, for display only, and the simpler, more practical ones for actual use. All the tea people I've met over the years all swear by yixing purple clay teaware as the best vessels for serving tea. They're all individually handcrafted, not thrown on a potter's wheel, Back in the day, the craftsman who made the teapot would sign it or inscribe his chop on the bottom. Yixing teapots are like jade, pearls, and other collectibles. There are good ones and bad ones. Unless you know what you're doing, it's easy to walk into a tea shop and get ripped off when you go buy one. There's a lot of stuff to know, but the main things you want to ensure is that the tea pours smoothly and no dribbling from the spout. The inside and outside of the teapot should be smooth. The lid should be nice and tight. In a random check of a hundred websites I've bookmarked, I saw Zisha teapots going for as low as $53 to as high as $250, with the average price for a four and a half ounce to seven ounce teapot going for about $150 or so. A hefty 1280 Norwegian krona. If you've never seen Yixing teapots before, at first you might not find them particularly attractive. Most of them have no decorations and are simply an unglazed, solid, earthy color. But the experts swear by them. They're small, functional, and perfect for when you're enjoying some real nice stuff. It's said there are about 125 individual steps to making a top-end handmade Yixing purple clay teapot. And for the Gong Fu tea ceremony that we'll talk about later, this is the only way to go. Because they don't dress themselves up with fancy designs or colors, the thing about these small purple, reddish, brownish teapots is the form, shape, and perfection of the body. And again, the mass popularity of Yixing teapots came about as a direct result of the Hongwu Emperor's edict calling for loose tea leaves to become the standard in the land. These 
and other 5 to 7 ounce teapots became perfect vessels for these kinds of leaves. And with the introduction of this unique Yixing ware, collectors on a budget and those who have millions to spend developed a passion for this tea ware. This passion will remain wildly popular and carry into the Qing and into our present day. The Gong Fu Tea Ceremony went hand in hand with the introduction and popularization of Yixing teaware. Yixing teaware isn't really meant for green tea. Well, there's no law that says you can't do it, but I can't remember ever seeing green tea being used in Yixing teaware in a Gong Fu Tea Ceremony. They're meant for either oolong or pu'er tea. The Gong Fu Tea Ceremony is like the opposite of dunking a cheap tea bag into a thick 10-ounce sea handle ceramic mug filled with boiling water. The name Gong Fu means this is a kind of activity requiring time, skill, and effort. Not easy or simple to do. It was ritualized, stylized, and ceremonial, yet at the same time not so stuffy and hoity-toity that the masses couldn't join in and participate as well. And because it was called Gong Fu Cha, as I said, it meant it took a little extra effort to make it. So there's an implied respect and humility in the whole ceremony between the one serving and the others being served. The Chinese Gong Fu Tea Ceremony isn't nearly as stylized, ritualistic, or symbolic as the Japanese Cha no Yu. Nothing like it at all. It's simply a way of preparing the best possible tea you can afford or get your hands on in the most precise manner to derive the best possible outcome. So many variables are at work at the same instant. Knowing how to manage everything is what separated the experts from the novices. How much tea to scoop out? How hot should the water be? How long do you brew? What water to select? In the typical Kung Fu tea ceremony, there are about a dozen things you'll need to do it up right. I've been to tea shops everywhere, and you could always get these tools of the trade in a set, or you could buy them separately. Many of the online purveyors of fine and distinctive whole-leaf teas also sell teaware and utensils and other fine accoutrement. Yixingware is the way to go, so you'll need a teapot and a tea pitcher to decant the tea into. An iron pot with a charcoal stove would be nice, but in a pinch there is always uh, hot plates or, worst case, uh, electric kettles to boil the water. Get something with a thermostat so you can monitor the water temperature. Different tea leaves require different water temperatures. You need three small cups. These tiny cups, now you've seen them before, they're called pin ming bei. So fanciful. Pin, remember, to sip. Ming, from History Tea Part 1, Ming is one of the ancient characters for tea, and Bei is a cup, a sipping teacup. Three cups works best. Three is the perfect number in that it represents heaven, earth, and oneself. So in the Gong Fu Tea Ceremony, it's always best to have one person doing all the Gong Fu and two guests. No rule says it has to be this way, so don't stress it. Besides cups, you'll also need various utensils to do your job. A strainer to place over the tea pitcher to avoid any leaves being passed from the teapot. There's a tea towel to keep all the spills and drips under control. You also have a cha he, a little scoop that measures out the tea leaves from your storage. And this scoop is used to transfer the leaves into the yixing teapot. And these Elongated scoops can be as simple or ornate as your heart desires. And one of the customs, after the server has scooped up some tea leaves, calls for everyone to first check out the cha he scoop and admire the leaves in their dried form. You'll also need a pair of tongs to handle the pin ming bei teacups. You don't want to be handling these tiny cups with your fingers. And there's also a tea pick. Just... Something to poke into the tea spout in case anything gets stuck in there. Hey, you never know. Many of these utensils are the same or variations of the utensils Lu Yu said you had to have in your tea toolbox. And the stage to perform all the steps is called a chop han, a tea tray. This is a nice 
flat surface with drainage that allows all the liquids to fall below the tray surface into a compartment that collects the water. All the action happens on top of this tea tray. The sky's the limit on what these things can cost. I've seen some pretty top-rate ones in my day. The Gong Fu Tea Ceremony does not have to use Yi Xing teaware. There's also the Gai Wan method. Gai means lid and Wan means bowl. These lidded cups were designed for loose-leaf tea. It's a covered tea bowl and you put your tea leaves in it and then you could either drink from the tea bowl or in the case of Gong Fu Cha, you can use it as the vessel to steep the tea leaves instead of another vessel like an Yi Xing clay pot or something like that. The Gai for the wan, the lid for the bowl, also has a secondary role as a strainer to hold the tea leaves in while you pour or drink. And as a lid, it also keeps the tea hot. These are wildly popular, and may I say, I'm more of a gaiwan person myself. The Gong Fu Tea Ceremony developed in, where else? Of course, Fujian Province. Always those guys. It became a very popular social custom in the Ming Dynasty. If you want to go on YouTube or Yoku, you can see hundreds of these videos showing how it's done. I've counted about 12 basic steps to this process. Each step in the Gong Fu Tea Ceremony has a special name that draws from poetry, legend, history, or something dramatic. And this ceremony is mostly about... Enjoying the best teas possible, using the most careful and deliberate preparation. And of course, enjoying it with people you love or admire. The Gong Fu Tea Ceremony, like any tea drinking experience, can be enhanced greatly with some relaxing or inspirational ambience and a couple good friends and some smart conversation. Remember from a previous episode, water is the mother of tea. Don't skimp. If you're going to pay 50 bucks for an ounce and a half of some top drawer oolong or puar, don't use water from the tap. And for crying out loud, remember what Lu Yu said and don't get it from the village well. Go get yourself some good spring water in a bottle. Just remember to recycle the bottle when you're finished. Filtered water will also do, but not recommend it if you can get the real thing. If you live in the mountains with a nearby unpolluted stream... Hey, baby, you hit the jackpot. Remember the old Chinese saying, three times boiled water is dead water. Only boil enough water to do what you gotta do. Try not to reboil the water. So tea took a nice, great leap forward in the Ming Dynasty. Again, we have the dynasty founder, Zhu Yuanzhang, to thank for that. Everything is starting to look more recognizable to us. By the time of the Ming Wanli Emperor, who reigned 1573 to 1620, it had been 4,300 years since Shannong first noticed the goodness of tea. It had evolved from a crude, bitter, medicinal brew to something barely palatable until the Sui and the Tang, when suddenly the masters of tea figured out better ways to process the leaves, and they turned the appreciation of tea drinking into an entire lifestyle and pastime that many around the world enjoy today. The lands bordering China and the lands bordering the lands that border China were also hooked on tea. They didn't go in for the fancy ceremonial stuff. For these people outside of China proper, life was rough, and tea played a daily part in their very survival. I mentioned what a big difference Princess Wencheng was to the Tibetan people when legend says she brought them the nutritional benefits of tea to the Himalayas. But there was a big world out there. As big as it was, there was more to it than Central Asia, the subcontinent, and the east coast of Africa. In the time of the Wanli Emperor, it had already been a century since the age of navigation. And now, Western people in greater numbers than when Marco Polo came are going to start knocking on China's door and announcing themselves for the first time And these, well, to the Chinese anyway, foul-smelling, crude, and barbarian men, too, are going to get themselves hooked on tea. And when they do, the world will never be the same again. Well, China's world, that is. And this story is going to be shelved until next time.
We'll look at the arrival of the Europeans next episode and what that's going to mean for China and the whole tea world. Tea doesn't stop evolving in the Ming Dynasty. We'll also look at advances in tea that happened during the Qing. We still have a whole lot more history and general info about tea. So if you've been looking at your watch these past 10 episodes and wondering how much longer, oh, I promise you the story is about to get much more interesting. We're always guaranteed a few yucks whenever East meets West. So please don't abandon ship just yet. Once again, mes amis, thanks so much for listening, streaming, downloading, however you found me. This is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from the city of Los Angeles, here in the state of confusion, wishing you all the best, and it's my greatest of hopes that you'll join me next time for another sapid episode of the Tea History Podcast.